So there we go. That was my cue. Welcome, everyone. It's very nice to see you. What a beautiful crowd. It's a lot of people. Um, my name is Silja Leifstadtir, and I am the very newly appointed curator of exhibitions at Bergen Kunsthal. Um, so this is all very new to me, but I'm very happy to be here, and I hope that I will see you several of you many times, uh, more times into the in the future. It's great to be here and it's also great to be here with Oscar and Lawrence. Um, so first, a few technical aspects. Um, this is um, a platform talk is uh, traditionally a chance to reflect and talk a bit to the artists, in this case, artists uh, collaboration. And while we have you in town, we opened the exhibition yesterday, the Water School. So today we get to sit here and reflect a bit on that and get to know both of you a little bit better. I also have to um, remind you that this um, is a talk that will, it's being streamed, so be aware that it's filmed. Um, we will talk for about 50 minutes, more or less, and then there will be open for questions from the audience. But because that it's streamed, it means that it's fantastic if you have questions. There will be a mic that someone will come around with so that you could ask the questions into the mic so that the people that are watching the stream will be able to hear the questions also from um, the audience. Um, can you hear me okay, first of all? It's all good? Okay, that's great. Um, so I will do a short introduction and then we will get uh, deeper into it. Um, so the exhibition uh, by Oscar to us all, the Water School at Bergen Kunsthal, uh, presents a series of new and older works connected to Ason's ongoing investigations of the politics of water. So the Water School is an ongoing project since 2016, through which Tuazon and collaborators explore the dynamics and power plays that regulates access to land, water and infrastructures. So in 2018, Oscar Tuazo founded the Los Angeles Water School as an educational center focusing on water as the connective tissue between people and their surroundings. And we also have the great pleasure at the exhibition downstairs, some of you already saw it uh, yesterday, also includes a series of masks by Lawrence Ulak Avakana, as a native uh, Alaskan artist and an early mentor of Tuazo. And you have a long-standing friendship before I go into this, I just wanted to... There's people that's looking at the stream that might not be able to see the exhibition that we will talk about. Um, but to describe it a little bit for those that are online, very shortly, the exhibition contains four different architectural structures, models large enough to sit and be inside. And I, yesterday, I witnessed the fantastic transformation transformation from it being this static sculpture that the team has been working on for a few weeks. And it suddenly yesterday turned into a structure that can support activities and conversations, and it became a living thing, a space and not this object. And that was amazing to witness it, having seen it for several weeks first at this very static object, and then seeing it filled with people yesterday as it should be, was a really special experience. And for those who were there, I don't know if several of you noticed, but it was a very comfortable and cozy space to be in where people really wanted to just be and linger inside those spaces. And also, when I talked to people, several mentioned that it's such a generous project, but it also is a very happy, in a sense, because it is this very positive project. So it was a very special energy. Um, and the five masks made by Lawrence in the exhibition, most of them, for you who haven't seen it, are placed above the entrance to each space. So these masks kind of hoovered over all of us last night and reminded us about the rituals and the traditions and cultures that are integral to the water school projects. So it was just gave this very nice extra 
energy yesterday. I hope you all get to see it and we will look more um, at your work. We have the fantastic possibility to look more into it. But now I will give the word to Oscar because we all want to know how you two met and how this mentorship and friendship has evolved. Indeed. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. And by way of in, uh, introducing Lawrence, I, I'll, I'll tell a little bit about <coughs> the beginnings of this project, the Water School. Um, for me, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I always like to say that um, Water School has always existed, that it's, um, it's indigenous to water, and it's, um, uh, it's uh, something that I first experienced or discovered um, in 2016 when I went to, to Standing Rock. And um, this was a, a kind of, for me, an, an incredible pedagogical uh, experience and environment where um, the the camp of water protectors gathered there um, on the Cannonball River to prevent the construction of the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, the camp had grown to, to 10,000 people and so it was in a sense a temporary city, a pop-up city um, motivated by uh, conservation and protection of clean water but also um, expressed through architecture, through all kinds of forms of, of, of everything from tents, uh, temporary shelters, up to, to more uh, um, quasi-permanent structures, nomadic structures. Even when I was there, um, the beginnings of a Coast Salish longhouse um, were being built. And there was this kind of activity of building um, that really resonated with me as an artist, uh, as a sculptor, as, as an artist interested in architecture, um, I felt that I was coming home. I felt mm -hmm. uh, here, this, right. you know, uh, is, is uh, a place um, where all of us are using the tools of art to, um, to work in a... A functional utilitarian way to, to try and solve problems, very inspiring. And um, and and the the two lessons that I took away from Standing Rock were Mini uh, Water is Life. That was kind of the slogan that um, became part of this international movement. And then something that Fawn Sharp, the the chairwoman of the Quinault tribe, said at the time. She said, "Water connects us all." And um, those two simple lessons really stuck with me. And so I went back to Los Angeles, where I live, and I had this piece of architecture myself that I was already working on. And that was the moment when I realized um, that this structure could be a kind of water school and host these kind of um, conversations that were already happening around water. Those conversations that, that I first saw at Standing Rock really mapped a geography of, of water across the whole continent and connected through indigenous knowledge in the various communities mm -hmm. from Standing Rock to Quinault to Los Angeles to, to Alaska. That an understanding of water that really um, was uh, very broad and um, so the structure began to occupy various different sites in relate, relationship to that conversation. It's a, a community conversation. It's also a family conversation. And mm -hmm. um, when I was invited here to, to Kunsthalbergen, um, it was a, a privilege to be able to, to really bring together these different aspects of the water school that have existed in various places and model that. Um, but for me, it really also um, was a, a, a kind of journey of discovery of my own mm -hmm. <laughs> origins and my own um, uh, uh, beginnings as an artist. And, and um, when I was a, a young child, you know, probably 10 years old, you know, yes. 10 to 15 right. um, in that area, 
um, my first exposure to uh, to sculpture, in a sense, and to, to a sculpture studio, and uh, the practice of an artist um, was uh, with Larry, mm -hmm. where we were both living at that time in Suquamish, Washington, Pacific yeah. Northwest. Mm -hmm. um, our families were close, mm -hmm. uh, connected through the Suquamish tribe. And um, the, there's, there's so much to say, um, but the, the, the pivotal moment for me was um, Larry was, was carving a, a, a sign for the Indianola ball field. Right. Um, this slab of, of red cedar Western red cedar, probably from an old growth right, yes. log, you know, 500 year old piece of, of wood, just beautiful um, work of carving that involved a pattern, a basket pattern across yes. the whole surface. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, I must have been maybe I was 16, 17, I don't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and you showed me how to, to carve this pattern, these right. little squares mm -hmm. to make the basket pattern. And then you gave me the knife. Mm -hmm. And then you gave me the keys to your studio. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which mm -hmm. was just an incredible um, act of generosity and mm -hmm. of, of trust. First of all, that I wouldn't right. cut off my finger, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which I, I still got all ten. <laughs> right. uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it was also really a, um, a, a moment when I spent time in that space with, mm -hmm. with the skin boat hanging in the rafters right. yes. and the uh -huh. glass kiln right. and yes. the stone carving mm -hmm. area and all right. of the, mm -hmm. the tools that you had mastered mm -hmm. uh, were there for me to absorb. And so, mm -hmm. um, so uh, thank you right. for that. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> thank you uh, for accepting the invitation yes. uh, here to Bergen. Yes. And, uh, yeah, my, uh, my journey uh, to get it get that at the at that point in Suquamish was that um, I am uh, Inupiaq, Inupiat from northern Alaska originally. My my parents uh, raised me in uh, Utkalvik. Utkalvik uh, is the name of the village and the English name is uh, Barrow and uh, it's a whaling village and we still continue whaling for subsistence, just for food. And uh, when we do catch whale, we um, uh, give it out to the people uh, in ceremony. And uh, usually it's uh, three, uh, th three or four times a, a year that we give out uh, the product of the whale to the people. And so, uh, Usually, um, when I uh, went to Suquamish, I, uh, we, we gathered there and I built my house and my studio and uh, we uh, started uh, with my ex-wife, uh, she was Suquamish, and we had two, one child and then we had another child, uh, my son and my daughter. And uh, we wanted to um, bring together um, traditional native people together to talk about uh, our uh, ancestors and talk about uh, song and dance and stories and things like that, just to gather together and to, um, to get familiar with each other and have a community of uh, artists and and people like people that uh, enjoyed uh, other cultures uh, and to express themselves. So that's where I met uh, his, his um, Oscar's mother, and she's uh, part uh, Norwegian and like myself. Uh, my grandfather is uh, from uh, Sandy Fjord, 
<laughs> and so um, uh, there's a, a long story about uh, how uh, that happened. But, uh, <laughs> and um, so uh, we uh, kind of um, got close and, and uh, had, had that uh, feeling of, uh, uh, of uh, kinship, you know, because uh, she was uh, from Norway. Uh, her ancestors, part of it was from Norway, too. And so, um, and also, she's uh, Lanape uh, from the East Coast uh, of the uh, United States, um, along the coast there, from all the way from um, Canada, southern Canada, French Canada area, uh, Quebec, and down along the coast and uh, along the uh, uh, Smoky Mountains, uh, the ridges and everything. And all the way down to almost Florida uh, is uh, Lenape people, and uh, the uh, the I the first time I've ever met uh, 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 native people from the uh, United States, uh, southern United States, or the main United States, was I went to school at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, the school, they started uh, two, oh, about uh, two years or three years before I went there. And, uh, and they, it was a uh, kind of a um, uh, uh, starting an idea uh, through, um, there was uh, several uh, Native American artists who uh, wanted to uh, teach uh, art but also incorporate uh, traditions of these people that came to this school. And so, uh, and also the instructors were Native American. There were Pueblos, there were uh, uh, Plains people, there were Apaches, there were um, many other uh, instructors that came from different places to work there. And so that, that was uh, my introduction of understanding my culture, uh, the Inupiaq culture. Um, because I was raised uh, when I was born uh, in Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, I lived in Barrow for a little while with my parents. And then my dad moved to Anchorage and for, for uh, a job with the National Guards. And so uh, he... Um, that's, uh, you know, I, I did speak Inupiaq when I was little, but uh, being raised in, in an urban uh, setting uh, with uh, basically non-native people, uh, I lost my language, but uh, retained uh, the feeling of uh, wanting to uh, understand who I was, you know, and so... Uh, I think the school really helped me open up that uh, um, idea of being uh, being Inupiaq. And so um, then um, when I was um, working uh, uh, and going to school, then uh, I got a, a chance to uh, go to uh, Coop Union School of Art in New York, New York City. And that introduced me to, um, to artists that were uh, uh, taught by Paul Clay, uh, Kandinsky, and uh, other people, and also uh, some uh, uh, Chinese um, instructors uh, with calligraphy and things like this, you know, that I haven't really experienced before. Then uh, trying to live in the city of uh, New York was, uh, was terrible. You know, <laughs> I, I couldn't do it. Uh, so I, I transferred to Rhode Island School of Design. And I started uh, doing sculpture there and, and learning uh, drawing, uh, uh, figure drawing and things like this, you know, and, uh, and taking uh, different uh, courses. 
And uh, I started uh, wondering, uh, there was a, uh, um, uh, a workshop at the top of the building, and it was a glass studio. And it was run by um, uh, Dale Chihuly, who was a glass artist. Uh, and uh, he was just getting his um, a master's degree and uh, to, uh, 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 you know, at the school and, and also um, working there. And uh, so I had, uh, so I got to work with glass, uh, blow glass, and uh, to help them uh, teach a little bit with uh, other students and being a uh, tech for, uh, for the uh, school. And so um, that introduced me to materials that I have never worked with before. And so um, when I uh, graduated from there, I got a, uh, uh, National Endowment Grant through the uh, government and to set up a glass studio in Barrow. And so we blew glass, uh, set up the studio and in a uh, Quonset hut, big large Quonset hut and in gravel inside and they used it for storage. But uh, on a sec one section there was a nice uh, room to set up a glass studio, and and so uh, and also living in uh, living in Barrow at that time that was in 1973. Uh, they still didn't have a, a sewer system. They didn't have a water system, and uh, they had. Um, the uh, uh, gas wells for uh, for gas for heating though in in the in the village, but uh, you you collected or you bought uh, ice, and uh, they they uh, trucked it in using uh, snow machines and sleds, and you bought uh, you know the ice for for drinking water, and you boiled it. And so that uh, was my introduction to water and, and the use of water and, and the need for water and, and uh, in, in a very, uh, very uh, uh, almost uh, primitive uh, way of working, uh, collecting water. And so uh, I, that was my introduction with the, uh, with the uh, traditions in, in Barrow, with the Inupiaq people, because we still contain our traditions, our ceremony, our songs, our uh, um, our um, gifting of uh, material, tools, and also the gifting of food, and and relating to your relatives and how you. Uh, yeah, uh, approach your relatives and things like this. So it was uh, a very uh, eye-opening experience for me. Then uh, I uh, got a... Uh, <clears throat> I was um, teaching after I did a small stint with the glass. We, we turned off the glass studio because uh, the permafrost started uh, thawing out underneath the furnaces. I, th I thought I insulated enough, but I didn't. <laughs> so it started tilting, you know, and we <laughs> kind of noticed in the furnace, there was two furnaces, and we melt the glass in the furnace and worked out of the furnace. And so uh, it melted, and it started turning a little bit, and so we uh, <laughs> completely shut it off and took everything down, and, and the... Um, so... Uh, so that was my adventure with glass. And, was that and the, at the time, would you say that was the furthest north glass shop? Yes, it was. <laughs> yes, it was. The farthest glass, nor uh, glass shop in, uh, in the world, I would think. Uh, but uh, we really, uh, you know, I taught uh, high school students uh, how to blow glass. And, and, uh, and still, you can find pieces of glass uh, all over the village. And, mm. and uh, you know... Like, uh, like 
when you find um, um, oh uh, ivory pieces or something on the shore, you know, it's kind of like uh, they keep it very sacred piece of glass. You know? mm, mm, yeah. <laughs> I, I work with uh, white glass and also uh, a red glass, so it was kind of unique with working with the, that type of glass. And then uh, I went down, trans I went, lived in Anchorage after that and uh, was a uh, sculpture uh, supervisor for a, uh, an art center there in Anchorage. And it was near the airport, and um, so a lot of uh, non-natives and natives uh, got together, and it was an open studio, so they got to, uh, you know, uh, artists come in, and if they didn't have any space for working with stone or ivory, or there, there were um, also, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, fabric, uh, Making, you know, um, some uh, what is it? Uh, Textile and weaving. Weaving. Mm. Yeah, there was weaving there and <clears throat> things like this, and so um, and um, so I, I taught there for about uh, a couple of years, and then then uh, went down to Santa Fe again and started teaching there for uh, several years and. Uh, and started uh, the glass studio there. Uh, there was a furnace there, one furnace, and so uh, I had uh, several students. Uh, we started back because Dale Chihuly, he uh, he set up a glass studio there, a studio there a year before that uh, in Santa Fe at the institute and. Uh, taught glass uh, with uh, native people there, uh, different. Uh, there was an instructor, he was, uh, I think he, I uh, can't remember for sure um, what tribe he was, but he was uh, the instructor there before me. Mm. But uh, that's when he started and I took over using the furnace. And uh, then uh, I was there for a couple of years and then, then went uh, decided, uh, my ex-wife decided, you know, wanting to, we had a son. And so she wanted to raise uh, our son uh, as being Suquamish, uh, Salish. She, she was Salish, uh, Suquamish. And so uh, we moved to uh, Suquamish, and it's a tribe that is Salish, that also the, uh, the city of Seattle was owned by the Suquamish people. And so uh, they took over, the government took over it and uh, created Seattle. And there's also another small tribe there, uh, still there, uh, the Duwamish. And so uh, then uh, that's when uh, I met Oscar and at that time. If I remember correctly, this glass window pieces that mm -hmm. are in the exhibition they're also partly there. Mm -hmm. It has a connection. Yeah, that's a, in a way you. where the the story comes full circle yeah. exactly. for me. Right, right. Uh, there yeah. are many <laughs> circles in the in the exhibition. <laughs> long, <laughs> this is a long explanation about that. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go through that. You know. Yeah, well, it's yeah. All, um, it comes around. Yes, eventually, and uh -huh. and so. Um, for me, uh, that circle, the story came full circle again in, in what was it, 2020, 20, mm -hmm. it was around the pandemic time, right? Right, yes. Larry was moving from Suquamish uh, after many to, years there. To uh, Homer, Alaska. Mm. That's south central Alaska. Um, all right on the coast also. It's a, it's a commercial and also a... Uh, um, fishing uh, village, you know. Mm. It's not very big, uh, but uh, but my uh, wife, uh, my present wife, uh, is uh, originally from Nome, uh, Alaska. That's where she was born. And her uh, grandfather and her mother 
uh, are from Point Hope. And uh, my mother is from Point Hope. And, um, and she was born there in Point Hope. And then uh, when she was a little, they moved to Prudhoe Bay, uh, where the oil fields are. And uh, at Dead Horse is the main, uh, um, main place where they uh, start the, uh, um, uh, the uh, what is it, uh, uh, the pipeline, pipeline for oil. Right. Uh, that's where it starts. And, mm. so, and, they, and they have areas where they have barges come in and things like that. And so uh, sh we have a house uh, about 18 miles from there. And uh, I could remember uh, going there with my mom. Uh, she'd worked at Prudo and, and uh, at the uh, cleaning rooms. And then when she's off, she'll take her snow machine and go to the house her, where she was raised. And it's this two-story house. It was a, a trading post. And uh, back when she was uh, little and... Uh, when they first got there, it was a tra it was still there. Uh, the trading post was built in the 20s, I believe, and then um, and also there's a, a sod house right next to it, uh, a house with uh, sod uh, around it, you know, a wooden frame and sod. So that's what they use for insulation. But uh, when I was there visiting her. Uh, when you know I was off off of school, I'd go over there and uh, with her and uh, uh, visit with her, and so she put me to work all the time. She was a really hard worker, and so uh, we'd go out and uh, to get water. You have to go out on the ice. Uh, the uh, and that was in the summer. So, but you had all this ice flow coming in. Uh, onto shore, there's a, a, um, a ver, uh, many islands off of there, kind of a strip of islands, and so the ice would pile up there. But but there was a lagoon between the, the Beachy Point and uh, also Jones Islands, we call them, and so we'd go out in a boat and collect uh, uh, water, ice. Uh, off the uh, off the off the uh, what is it uh, icebergs and stuff, and uh, you you have to go to different ones and test the water and or test the ice, see if there's any salt in it. So that then you then you pick and get chunks of ice and 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 take it back to the house and melt it and use it for drinking water. And, it, and you know it's 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 a real chore. You had to do it one day, a whole day, you know, to mm -hmm. collect your drinking water, you know, mm -hmm. and your washing water. Mm -hmm. So that was my introduction to the uh, the idea of you know um, in Anchorage you just open the faucet, you know. You didn't think about uh, you know how hard people work at trying to get uh, really uh, clean water, you know. Mm. That's, that's, that's a struggle now, I think. Mm. And so, um, and, um, and she was from Point Hope, and my father's from Barrow, and so uh, they gave me two names, uh, uh, Inupiaq names, Ulak, is uh, from uh, from the area of where my dad is, and he was my uncle, and also uh, <clears throat> my great grandfather uh, was named uh, Sicharak, so I have Sicharak from Point Hope, and so I have these two names that we we uh, name our ch children. And my son is uh, Avayak, named after my mother. And Avayak was her, um, uh, I think it was her grandfather, uh, Inupiaq grandfather. And so uh, from Point Hope. And so, um, 
you had, and then my daughter is Neyuk. Neyuk was uh, my uh, father's uh, brother that passed on, so we named uh, our daughter uh, Neyuk. So uh, that's how it goes with uh, naming uh, with our language. And we use those names when you meet people, you know, I'm Ulaq, you know, and, uh, and they say their name too. So we understand where, where they're from, from what region or what village they're from. And so it's on the north slope of Alaska. You have the Brooks Range, and then you have the north slope where the oil fields are and also where the National uh, Wildlife Refuge is. And, and there's, you know, there's a, a fight with uh, our people and with the oil companies wanting to uh, drill on the, uh, on the site because that's where all the uh, caribou uh, have their, um, you know, they have their... Um, Camping grounds? Yeah. Mm. We talked also the, about um, mm -hmm. this strange story with the migration mm -hmm. that happened in 1890. There's this strange story about by imitation from Alaska mm -hmm. and the United States. They wanted 500 reindeers and Sami people to come from Alta. Yes, yes, they Alaska came to, uh, to, teach to our people. With, yeah, reindeer and, uh, herding. My, un so my uncles there. were working exactly. as reindeer herders. <coughs> Yeah. And uh, they knew the uh, Samis there. So that's a very and funny. They, you know, they taught yeah. them how to speak in Upeak too. Exactly. So, yeah. So now there's did. lots of reindeers, and in uh -huh. case you didn't know, it's this very yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> story. It was going on for, uh, for, for you know, like, yeah. uh, I don't know, uh, 20, 30 years or something like that. And hmm. then uh, after a while, they uh, stopped doing it. Uh, because the caribou herds would take yeah. uh, the reindeer with them. Yeah. And so it changed uh, the um, dynamic of, of the pure uh, mm. uh, reindeer, uh, or the caribou with the reindeer, so they're smaller now and uh, mm. uh, in some areas. And, but the uh, majority of them are still have that, um, yeah. have that uh, solid reindeer, uh, caribou, you know, I think that kind of brings me along to a question, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Because I think what's interesting is, and what I wanted to ask both of you, kind of, is context and how that changes um, everything. Because mm -hmm. first this project can seem, you know, it's far away from Scandinavia and Norway, and then you start talking and then you find these mm -hmm. links. And then there's mm -hmm. also this Alta river protest that was this Alta big canyon river. So you start to sort of, even though it seems like it's far away geographically, when you start to sit inside the works and start to talk about the first relationship you have to water, the connections and the associations, they change a lot depending on the context. And I was curious because there's two quite uh, big changes. Of One context is the geographical one, having the water school um, there, but then here in this part of the world, but then it's also the change of um, context when it's in a public art artwork and then inside an institution. That's also a big change of on context. So I also wanted to ask how how you see, you can dwell on that a bit, how you see that this project can uh, change and evolve and also the difference between the it being a public project mm -hmm. and then inside mm -hmm. an institution. So. Yeah, what can us as an institution as well? How can we contribute mm. to that mm -hmm. project? Um, yeah, inside well. these walls somehow. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the thing that I realize as this, this nomadic structure has moved from Los Angeles first to uh, the Great Lakes region, there was an installation um, couple uh, different instances uh, in Michigan and in Chicago and uh, around the Great Lakes area where, of course, water is plentiful, but there are um, ongoing struggles just for um, 
clean and safe drinking water there in Flint, Michigan. Um, there was a, um, an ongoing um, problem with contamination of, of drinking water. Um, and so it has a, a particular context there that's different than, than the Los Angeles context, which is really, of course, defined by drought and um, lack of, of uh, water and um, water access. Mm -hmm. And then um, another site in uh, Minnesota at the headwaters of the Mississippi River, where, again, a, a, an oil pipeline is crossing um, bodies of fresh water on the White Earth Reservation. And um, there's struggles to protect that. And then finally, um, uh, here in the exhibition, one of the things that's, that's covered in depth is um, Cedar Spring, Nevada. Mm -hmm. Spring Valley, Nevada is a, an area um, that has a plentiful groundwater, a, a, a large aquifer underground. But it's an arid area that doesn't get a lot of rainfall. And um, so all the, the water comes from springs. And, um, the city of Las Vegas, 350 miles away, um, has for, for over three decades tried to build a water pipeline to pump the groundwater there and um, uh, had the, the backing of all of the, the state infrastructure, the, the hotel lobbies and so on. And um, uh, it was just recently defeated or, or this project was blocked um, through the, the efforts of um, the tribal communities there to protect that, um, that valley. And uh, so just to summarize a little bit, e each of these locations where the water school has been is, is really very different uh, connotations of, of water. What water means is, is very site specific. It's very regional. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's why I'd say um, the, the, the importance of um, indigenous ecological knowledge is, is so like, central to the whole thing because um, mm -hmm. those uh, you know, often oral histories that are passed down about water, the, the understandings of uh, right relationships to, to water and to resources, um, have been developed over tens of thousands of years. And, and um, so often, uh, you know, the, the more recent infrastructural projects, such as the Mulholland Aqueduct in Los Angeles, um, was built 100 years ago um, and considered the, the great marvel of civil engineering of the 20th century, 100 years later has become uh, a, a, an ecological catastrophe. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, it's something that, that in, in, in my mind could really have been avoided just through um, collaboration and, 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 and understanding of the environment. So um, <laughs> how does that all fit into, <laughs> into an institution uh, uh, such as this? I think, yeah. you know, I think a, um, a museum or, a, you know, an art, art spaces in general actually are... Um, really rich places of um, conversation and collaboration and um, spaces where, where these things can be um, modeled. And that, that, that also is, is really at the, the center of this um, project here, is the idea of, of taking um, architectural modeling tools scaling this project down to half scale and starting to look at it um, and in a way being able to also m model those larger um, uh, ecosystems, environmental um, uh, relationships and, 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 and model the relationships between those regions. Um, so. And I've noticed that um, it was a gathering place also, mm. wasn't it? Mm. And also uh, uh, architecture uh, involving tribal people, their, their uh, structures. 
they had to have a, a meeting place or a place to gather for ceremony. Mm -hmm. And so uh, architecture is very important. In, in, our, in my region, there were uh, kazagis. These are um, large, large, uh, larger places uh, that were, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, made out of uh, whalebone uh, structure and then covered with sod and, 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 uh, and also uh, the interior, uh, the entryway uh, to the, uh, to your uh, sod houses, you go through a tunnel and then go up into a room with a uh, hole in the floor. And so, um, and it's wood uh, inside, all wood around, and usually it's um, um, driftwood that uh, they used for, for that, and also whale bones for the structure of the building. And that's where they uh, had ceremony. The men would live in these large, large rooms, and the, um, the extended family the uh, the mothers would own their own houses, and uh, and the children would be raised in those areas. You know, so uh, you know I can understand the uh, the use of uh, structure. You know that. Uh, There's also an analogy mm -hmm. between those structures and the the body of the whale, right? That's very right, kind of yes. literal. That it, and it is uh, in Point Hope in Tigigak. They, they believe, um, I uh, still believe that uh, these, uh, um, these igloos, we call them, and so uh, you enter through the mouth of the whale into the interior, and there's a smoke hole on the top, which we call kingak, or it's the nose of the house, kingak. And so... Uh, we uh, feel that uh, we are uh, entering and emerging in, and being a part of this, uh, our uh, source of, uh, our main source of, of food and uh, survival. And so um, that's the way that uh, we felt uh, about our, um, our structures uh, of, uh, of our living. So back mm -hmm. in the not not too far distant uh, past, you know. Mm. So yeah, my my uh, grandfather, uh, Captain Peterson, he <laughs> would uh, he uh, sail sh uh, boats, and he was on whaling ships uh, uh, when they were when they were doing commercial whaling when he was a young man, and uh, then when they they stopped commercial whaling. He still uh, ran boats up along the coast of Alaska, all the way up to Canada, uh, supplying um, material, uh, food, uh, food uh, stuffs, uh, and uh, guns, and whatever they, uh, the uh, native people would need uh, for subsistence and for living. And so uh, he uh, dropped by uh, Point Hope, and he was very uh, friendly with my grandfather, who couldn't have any children. So he, uh, my grandfather, asked uh, Captain Peterson if he could have a child for him. And so my, that's how my mother came about hmm. uh, uh, okay. that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. she was a very beautiful woman. She was, <laughs> Look more uh, Scandinavian than you know than uh, Inupiaq, but she her first language was Inupiaq, mm -hmm. so she couldn't understand English, and so uh, she was very unique among the people because mm -hmm. they were mostly uh, pure blood people, uh, Inupiaq people, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, there was quite a few that uh, were uh, uh, inner relations. And uh, there were two sides to the village. One was the traditional side where, where the old village, and then they built a new one for the, uh, for the whaling people and, uh, and the other crews that were, and uh, other people that came.
to wail. Mm. And so they called it uh, Jabber Town because there were so many languages being spoken there that the, the Inupiaq <laughs> couldn't understand anything that they were, you know, speaking. So they called it Jabber Town. <laughs> and Mary, this, the, those two um, buildings that you describe, that, that's interesting to me, the, the two-story house mm -hmm. and then the sod that house. Wasn't Pruda Bay, yeah. The sod house, I guess, was the earlier, yes, right next older to it. Yes. structure. And um, the main house was for uh, for selling goods and also for living in uh, the summer, spring, summer, and fall. And so, um, but in the winter, you'd go to the uh, sod house. And so mm. you live in there. They lived in there. Earth uh, insulated. It's insulated and more insulated than than the because uh, there were uh, about maybe eight, ten inches or so, twelve inches of shiplap because of the whaling ships that were crushed in the in the uh, in the ice, and they were crushed. Uh, there was many uh, ships that were crushed. And uh, so they collected all the wood from those and built uh, this house. And it's a two-story house with, uh, clad with uh, tin, uh, one-eighth inch tin all the way around it, uh, except for the doors and windows, and that's it. And then the roof also is different. Uh, it's not, uh, didn't have tin on it, but it had regular uh, shingles on it, I believe, you know, on that. So one, the, the, the older house was really mm -hmm. an earth house. Yeah, it was a the newer house. That, that was, was the original house, yeah, at, before they built the, uh, mm. the other one. The second one yeah. was a house. Then they had a, uh, from they the, also had a, a kind of a storage uh, mm. uh, building also where they stored some of the colder items for the, uh, like the whaling implements and things like that. And, uh, other ropes and things like that that uh, the people might need, you know. So, yeah. Utilitarian. Building. And also, yeah, they stored the uh, furs also. Uh, that's how my grandfather, uh, he uh, uh, sold goods by uh, getting uh, trapped furs, you know, like uh, fox, uh, wolf, uh, wolverine. Furs and sometimes uh, back then they were uh, also getting uh, polar bear skins too, you know. So, and we use polar bear skins uh, for um, for the interior of our tents when we go out whaling. We uh, put down the uh, uh, polar bear skin, fur down, and then caribou skin on the top of there, and then that's your bed. Mm -hmm. And so it's very comfortable living out on the ice. Yeah. We still do that to this day. We yeah. st still hunt whale yeah. using skin boats. Yeah. And uh, there's a process of uh, using that too. And, uh, and what you're describing is also, seems always very connected to global, global commerce somehow. Right, mm -hmm. right. But Peterson arrived and yes. was, was sh shipping up and down the coast mm -hmm. to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Right. And the, the, the furs, of course, mm -hmm. were part of mm -hmm. a, a global trade. And mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's interesting to me. Also, then, the, the later generation of architecture, the Quonset Hut, mm -hmm. which is a military, I s assume, it was kind of a military right. architecture. Right, yes, yes, very much so. That mm -hmm. Representative different. Then also, there's a uh, there was a um, uh, Navy research lab in uh, right near Barrow, in between uh, Point Barrow and Barrow, and there was a research lab that they studied animals, and that's the first time I, I uh, they had a a building, and inside the building was a large cage, and they had a polar bear in there. They were studying polar bears, you know, the fur and mm. whatever, and and some of the things they they had fo uh, foxes, they had wolves there, and they and they did experiments with them and stuff, and it uh, were pretty bad mm. idea of holding these animals mm. in cages and things, you know, and uh, mm. and so they closed it down, but they gave it to our people, and so we we developed a college there. 
uh, Ilisalve College, which is a language college where you can understand, uh, where they study the language and, and mm -hmm. where they uh, teach the language to, uh, mm -hmm. to anyone that want to be teachers within the villages. So they'll send young uh, college students there to, uh, to uh, study. Mm -hmm. We're starting to run out of time, so I have one last question before uh, we will open the floor up for a few questions from the audience. So, um, I've, I've obviously, as we know by now, uh, you've also said that you're influenced by the expanded idea of culture as it is understood in the indigenous communities, and how <laughs> art is not something that's an illustration or an addition to something is an integral and integrated part of the culture, which is also an idea that I also really um, enjoy thinking of. But then, in our part of the world, um, uh, the art world also has this very capitalistic aspect to it. And I've started to see a change in young artists when I meet them, that they have more now than 10 years ago ethical questions, in the sense that I'm at being educated as an artist and I'm producing all these objects and producing and producing and putting something in to this art world and they're starting to question that way of doing it and I was wondering as a last question for me to you if, um, if you have any tips for the next generation <laughs> in terms of, of this and how do you deal with them? Because it's quite two opposites. You're sort yeah, of in yeah. between two worlds of the art world, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Yeah, it goes to both Recycle, of recycle, recycle. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I think it comes to me very naturally, but um, it's lately uh, something I think about a, a, a lot, you know, just as you described, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the impact, um, uh, environmental impact, carbon impact of, of the various <laughs> different things. And... Um, and in, in the show here, there are these series of, of windows that, um, that I produced. And, um, and, and I should mention, mm -hmm. they uh, were all produced with the kiln that I bought mm. from Larry. This was a kind of um, circular. full circular <laughs> moment. Um, when, when Larry moved his studio, I, I bought the kiln from him and, and have, have been... Um, practicing glass fusing um, with that tool. But the frames around those, those windows um, are recycled from another artwork. The, you know, a, an older artwork that I had in storage, this beautiful um, Douglas fir mm -hmm. boards that I had, kind of a big bulky piece. And it was one of those moments where I thought, well, I've got to give this a new life. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, uh, let go of the of the older work and um, make something uh, new with mm -hmm. that material, and it's um, that's kind of resonant to me. I think also in a in a in another way, um, you know, glass is this material that can be constantly recycled. Oh yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think um, uh, your work in glass has always <laughs> mm -hmm. been um, an influence on me, and um, just wondering if you could say a, a little bit about your work in glass, and, mm -hmm. and specifically like about glass and light. Because I think of this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. northern and Arctic relationship mm -hmm. to to light and to ice um, is really mm -hmm. comes through in in your glass work. Mm -hmm. uh, when I did uh, start working with glass, it was mo mostly making containers, you know, making things uh, for utilitarian purposes. But uh, then uh, when I moved to Washington, I started uh, fusing uh, flat glass. And there was a company that started, uh, Bullseye Glass Company. 
that uh, dealt with uh, basically uh, fusing uh, uh, artists for for artists that uh, do fusing and and also um, they did have a small uh, uh, hot shop there too and they have kilns uh, so that they have uh, workshops that uh, they can use these kilns there in 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 Portland mm -hmm. and so. Um, I started working with uh, with uh, the idea of um, um, using glass as a, a pictorial uh, use, you know, making uh, uh, landscapes of uh, the North region, and so um, and also uh, the clothing of uh, our people. They used uh, calfskin, black and white calfskin, to create geometric designs. And that was kind of very, very familiar and very easy to incorporate into uh, a glass form. So uh, that's where the, uh, the idea of that uh, came about, you know, using glass mm -hmm. and, and incorporating it with tradition, you know. And the new glass artists that are coming out who are glass blowers are starting to uh, uh, use uh, or they they start to, with the idea of the tr traditional materials and then they uh, turn it turn the uh, the images into glass and also even rooms of glass where there were really just uh, panels of wood um, uh, uh, designed on the on the wood panels, uh, like the Clinket, the Haida people uh, in the south southeastern Alaska, and also in Washington and Canada, they're starting to use uh, more glass uh, uh, in their projects, and uh, like large. Uh, uh, spindle whirls where they make the uh, clo uh, the the cloth or the you know the goat uh, f for they use goat Yarn. for to make the mm. uh, you know for uh, weaving mm. and so they make these large uh, spindle whirls of uh, designs of the animals designs and thing Northwest Coast style uh, designs in the glass and then use uh, a large glass uh, uh, kind of a uh, length, you know, to hold uh, that round form. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's a it's, uh, unique uh, the material that, uh, you know, is relating to um, their idea of how to emulate tradition into a new product mm -hmm. you know I think you know yeah another form of another, recycling mm -hmm. yes yeah. uh -huh. right and it's a recycled product so mm -hmm. it's it's mm -hmm. uh, you know it's it's something that everybody uh, uses in life you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. so yeah okay are there any questions from the audience and if so there is should be a mic somewhere out there as well if there is Anyone? Mm. <laughs> no. <laughs> this one in the back. Hi, it's a. Uh, I was able to walk around the exhibit, and it's extraordinary and uh, profoundly soulful, and a beautiful experience. And I look forward to spending more time there. I'm a native of Los Angeles. I'm actually a child of the California desert. And uh, from the time I was an infant, I remember climbing up on the roof of my family home and just watching the fires kind of sweep through the canyons. And that was kind of a yearly experience. And always hearing about the water, of course, not really coming locally, that it was coming from Northern California or the Colorado River. And I thought I'd just ask, what is your take on the water experience of LA? Because yeah. it seems like it's 
growing up there, it was always that I felt I was growing up in a drought region, but it was such a plentiful, large city also. So it's always felt like a contradiction as a native. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. I, I moved to Los Angeles about 10 years ago, and um, it, I, it took me quite a while to even notice the Los Angeles River, right? Like, it's really at the center of the city. The LA River runs through the center of the city, and you're constantly crossing it, but it's this concrete channel. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's really this kind of, like, mm. bunker architecture that was built uh, as flood control. Um, uh, but it has left the, the river kind of neglected at the center of, of the city. And... Um, so when I started this, you know, I came back to L.A. after Standing Rock and started thinking about a water school there, I had a studio a block from the L.A. River. And so I, I immediately, you know, turned to the indigenous communities of Los Angeles to, to try and understand, like, what is this river? What was this river? What's the historical significance of it? And... Um, and that was an amazing learning experience historically, um, also around language. You know, mm -hmm. the, the original village site of Los Angeles, Yangna, is there, you know, kind of right where um, downtown Los Angeles is right now. It's kind of where the, the Pasadena part of the river comes into the main river at this um, juncture. And in spite of, like, the, you know, uh, long colonial history of Los Angeles, um, longer than, than most parts of the United States, the language persists. And so this was like a really um, crucial uh, moment for me to, to understand the Tongva language and like a, a kind of um, Tongva map of Los Angeles that, um, you know, there are a few words, Topanga and... Um, uh, place names um, that always speak about water. There's always a, a, a description of water in these words, and um, so that's a, that was a kind of a beginning point. But as you say, all the water from contemporary Los Angeles comes from elsewhere. Comes from first from Owens Valley, and now from the Colorado River, and and so there's this really r real sense in which the city is dependent on other rural geographies and um, has a responsibility to these places that hasn't always been um, honored, but it, it seems like a really important educational um, or, you know, a, a shared educational project to understand where the water that we're drinking is coming from and... Um, mm. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting, yeah, I'm reflecting on this because for the last 50 years we've seen water as a commodity and as a part of infrastructure that's poured from a tap into a, a glass, but we have a, no sort of uh, traditional cultural uh, con connection to the, how the water moves in the landscape or, or where it comes from. But within urban planning, this seems to be changing now, you know, where the, um, we either have too much water or too little water. So making water visible in the, our streets with, with regard to drainage <coughs> to solve the, the problem of too much water or, or to um, make it visible as part of an urban experience, you know, it, it, it is um, coming more and more up. Uh, how do you see you, your, your work uh, and the, the focusing you have on uh, um, in, in, in the water school as part of, you know, this new awareness of water as a commodity, mm. which is more than just you know something just to be consumed. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's um, that really making making the invisible visible is kind of the the starting point where a lot of these mm -hmm. things can um, become tangible in terms of. Uh, at the at the scale of a city, also at the scale of a house, you know the um, the the models here in in the gallery um, 
are modeled on the house of Stephen Hawley Bayer, who uh, in 1969 to 1972 built this house, the Zome House, um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And it's a house that is very um, didactic in terms of energy and water use. Um, it is a passive solar house, kind of considered one of the early passive solar houses, and it has a south-facing facade of these huge windows that you can't see out of at all because they're um, filled with 55-gallon drums full of water that, that block that facade. So you get the, the harsh sun of the desert blocked and in shade by those drums. The sun heats the water in those drums during the day, those hot days and in the desert. And then at night, the radiant ed energy, uh, the sunlight heats the house. So um, it's a kind of way of using water and sunlight in architecture that um, that is really uh, educational, I think. And, and it kind of requires a more active um, engagement with architecture. Uh, but it's that's just always inspiring to me to think about how to extend those projects. Mm. Mm. Yeah. No more questions. Okay. Oh, sure. Then I guess it's um, um, just time to say thank you so much to everyone that came. And um, take, if you didn't already, take a good look at the exhibition downstairs. The video piece will give you a lot of information. And um, thank you so much, mm -hmm. Lawrence. Yes. And Oscar for coming all this way. Oh, <laughs> yes. It's, uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, first time what a being journey. in this region and... Yeah. And in Europe, whatever, uh, the only place I've, uh, the farthest I've ever went was um, uh, Greenland uh, and Nook. And, uh, now Bergen, that's the first now Bergen. place in Europe. So wow. be proud. Yeah. Amazing. It was really good. Thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> <laughs>